Once again, for all those who are just joining, we are going to start in about 60 seconds. You know, grab your second cup of coffee, maybe stretch your legs before we strap in for the event. Thanks so much. All right, well, let's get this party started. Um, hello and welcome uh, to a virtual event hosted by Demand Progress Education Fund titled The Power of Unions in Congress, Know Your Rights. I'm your host, Taylor J. Swift. I'm a policy advisor with Demand Progress. Before joining our team, I worked in Congress for several years, so this topic of today's virtual event is really important to me and it's important to our team at Demand Progress. We've been publishing research and advocating for better working conditions for congressional staff for years now as a part of our effort to strengthen Congress itself. Congress's ability to function well depends on attracting and retaining a well-trained expert staff devoted to making our democracy work for everyone. Congressional staff work in Washington, D.C. and throughout the country in every state and thousands of offices. They help Americans in countless ways, working with constituents in their districts and their states, uh, meeting with businesses, drafting legislation, helping conduct oversight, the works. In short, they, they help keep ru Congress running. But contrary to popular belief, congressional staff salaries, especially for entry and mid-level positions, are actually really low. Recent evidence shows that one in eight staffers are not making a living wage, and that number jumps to roughly 70% for entry-level positions. There isn't just one reason that congressional staffers are pushing to unionize, but a combination of factors that create an untenable work environment. Combine this with the ongoing trauma, the pay disparities, the never-ending work, unchecked harassment, ongoing COVID, and the January 6th attack last year, make it really, really difficult for anybody to have any leverage and weak workplace safety protections. But next Monday, July 18th, the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights will implement the resolution that grants House staff the right to organize. This is a huge deal that was months, years, actually a quarter century in the making. And to help educate the general public and empower congressional staff with the knowledge they need to successfully implement unions in the House of Representatives, our team at Demand Progress Education Fund has brought together several government labor experts to discuss various rights and protections offered to staff. So how does this unionization work in Congress? What's the history behind congressional unionization? What rights will be granted to the congressional employees? What additional work remains to cover more staff in the House or in the Senate or in joint staff? Well, over the next hour or so, our distinguished panel of experts Oops, excuse me, we'll discuss this and other topics and, of course, be able to take audience questions as well to clear up any outstanding questions. With that, it's my privilege to introduce Representative Andy Levin, who unfortunately couldn't be in attendance today, but sent some brief remarks. So let me just share my screen really quickly. Hi, everybody. I want to thank Demand Progress for putting together this fantastic panel. I'm always excited to talk about one of my favorite things in the world, unions. Increasing workers' voice and power in their workplace, in their industry, and in our society at large is at the very center of my politics. I've spent the better part of my career fighting for workers' rights as a union organizer at SEIU, at the AFL-CIO, and now as a member of Congress. I'm pretty much the union organizer in Congress and creating a multiracial working class movement to transform society is probably the single biggest organizing passion of my life. 
As both a frontline union organizer and a government official, I've seen both sides of the coin. The struggle that workers face every day and the power that comes with their ability to form a union and bargain collectively. Over the past year, we've witnessed workers exercising that power in new and exciting ways. Workers are on the march in workplaces that have fought unionization for years. Think Starbucks, Amazon, Apple, Trader Joe's, you name it. Despite Starbucks spending millions of dollars on union busting lawyers and consultants, there are now over 180 unionized Starbucks stores across the country and more than 120 others have elections pending. Wow, that's incredible. Meanwhile, Amazon held up to 20 captive audience meetings a day leading up to the election in their Staten Island warehouse, yet the Amazon labor union persevered and won a big victory there. Last October, the world watched as over 100,000 workers joined together to go on strike in different places all across this country. Folks even gave the month a new name, Striketober. That momentum has continued well into this year. There were already 153 strikes from January to May of 2022, compared to 78 strikes during the same period in 2021. That's almost twice as many. It's incredible. Workers are fed up with low wages, poor benefits, and disrespect. And they're flexing their collective muscles by creating their own organizations and acting collectively. Look, y'all, there is real power in a union. I'm so inspired by the workers leading in this moment and creating the great next chapter of our American labor movement. And guess what? That includes workers fighting to have a union right here in the halls of Congress, our own staffers. House staffers help Congress operate in every way and they serve the American people. Unfortunately, until two months ago, they were not promised legal protection for acting or bargaining collectively. Following the passage of the Congressional Accountability Act way back in 1995, the Office of Compliance, which is now known as the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights, adopted regulations that would extend legal protections to congressional staff who choose to organize and bargain collectively. These regulations required congressional approval for enactment. At the time, Congress applied them to all the workers on Capitol Hill, like the Capitol Police and the Library of Congress, except the folks who work for us directly in our district offices, DC offices, and committees. So for 26 long years, our own direct staff have been denied this fundamental human right to have a say at work. Earlier this year, I was approached by the Congressional Workers Union and asked to introduce a resolution finally approving these regulations for them. I was so honored to be asked. The resolution garnered tremendous support, earning 165 original co-sponsors. It was undeniable that this was the right thing to do, but it wouldn't have happened without the workers taking that first step. At long last, on May 10th, the House passed my resolution, completing the final step to give most congressional workers in the House legal protection to organize and bargain collectively. On July 18th, these regulations will take full effect, extending legal protection to House staff who choose to unionize. See, power in a union, right in the temple of our democracy. It's been an incredible honor to work with the Congressional Workers Union as they fought tirelessly for their rights at work. They shared bravely their workplace experiences, good and bad, clearly illustrated their need for the protective right to organize, and demonstrated the sheer power of worker solidarity. It's a privilege to be able to support their efforts through legislation. All workers deserve a union, from coffee shops to warehouses to the halls of Congress. I'm here to keep on fighting right alongside them. Thanks so much in solidarity. Great, um, so thank you so much to Representative Andy Levin for those remarks. Um, now we're going to turn to our panel um, I have the privilege to introduce our moderator today, uh, Catherine Tully McManus, who is a congressional reporter for Politico and the author of their Huddle newsletter focused on Capitol Hill. Catherine has covered Congress for close to a decade, including more than eight years at CQ Roll Call, where she got hooked on finding often overlooked stories about Congress as an institution, operation, and life in the Capitol complex. Catherine brought her obsessions with Congress, uh, with its, how it funds itself, the congressional workplace, 
capital security, and the oddities of the legislative branch to her huddle newsletter. So with that, I'm going to hand the baton off to Catherine to introduce the rest of our panelists. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, on our great panel today um, are Kevin Mulshine, who is the former counsel of the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights, although when he was there, it was the Office of Compliance. Um, and I know that Kevin has been deeply involved in these issues for a long time. Um, when I was just first getting on the Capitol Hill beat, I gave Kevin a call after he told me I did not have a fact right about how congressional workplace operated. Um, and I've learned so much since. Uh, so grateful to have you on the panel today. Also here today are Jeff Friday, the general counsel at the National Federation of Federal Employees, represent a huge number of federal employees, and Yvette Piacek, deputy general counsel at the National Federation of Federal Employees. And this pair will hopefully give kind of a window into how unionization happens and operates at this point off the hill and on the hill um, as they represent a wide range of employees across the federal government. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, and so I would like to start with a little bit of background and a little bit of how we got here. Um, Kevin, can you address quickly kind of part one of this unionization effort on Capitol Hill that happened shortly after the Congressional Accountability Act passed, um, just so we can get us quickly up to the modern era? Sure, thanks, Catherine. It's good to, good to see you again and, um, and I'm, uh, really pleased with Demand Progress for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, what I'd like to do, if I could, is to just to share my screen to show you uh, some of the uh, headlines that were going on in the spring and summer of 1996 in advance of this uh, um, implementation, uh, generally, of the Congressional Accountability Act. Um, you'll see from some of these um, uh, headlines, um, the idea that Congress in uh, passing the Congressional Accountability Act was, was doing so, so that it could experience how to uh, comply with the laws that they were um, passing for the, the private sector, and, and in this case, the federal sector. Um, and um, this one is from my former boss, uh, Dennis Duffy on Wall Street Journal, but we made the front pages of um, the New York Times. This is one about uh, the uh, Capitol Police and the architect uh, employees starting up a, uh, uh, a, a um, campaign. This one, oops, let's see. Yeah, I guess I can't see the whole thing, but this is a, a um, ed editorial from the Hill newspaper and the, the caption there is the dignity issue. And it, it uh, mentions Steven Schlossberg, who at that time was a, uh, a, a former official in the Reagan administration, head of the office of the International Labor Organization, talking about how um, employees, even if they consider themselves to be professionals, um, deserve to have a bargaining agent. And um, this one was particularly uh, pointing out how important it was for staffers to have, uh, to be able to select their agent. Um, this one is uh, from the Washington Times. Uh, uh, congressmen were uncomfortable with the idea of uh, having to uh, have campaigns, uh, um, organization campaigns in their offices. Um, but that's something that uh, private business and federal sector experience uh, daily. Um, this is one showing that in July of 96, uh, the um, House Oversight Committee, which was uh, the name given to House administration was trying to move to ban 
unionizing because they were so concerned about uh, it being uh, incongruent with uh, their constitutional responsibilities. Um, this one, uh, again, first front page of the New York Times, uh, GOP having second thought. And uh, a stratagem came up. Uh, they decided that because they had required the Office of Com Compliance uh, board to rule separately on congressional staff, this one is their solution. They didn't vote. So, um, so they were able to uh, create a logjam uh, that has uh, persisted through Republican lead in the Congress to start out with, through Democratic lead in the Congress. Um, and then finally, um, the Miami Herald editorializing about going back to the plantation, which was the way that uh, uh, the Congress was uh, regarded before the passage of the Congressional Accountability Act. And in essence, right now, um, congressional staffers are part, part of the plantation. Um, they don't have the rights and the protections that are offered to other legislative branch employees like the architect employees, like the Capitol Police, like the recording studio employees on the House side. And, um, and fortunately, and thanks to Rep, uh, Representative Levin, uh, that's going to end on the 18th. Uh, in the Senate, they're happy to have that uh, logjam continue, and hopefully there'll be some uh, enlightened members of the Senate who will really press this through. Um, there's nothing to fear from having a collective bargaining agent for the, your employees, uh, so I'll stop that. Um, the other I thing I would say, if I can, just... Uh, Congress has effectively captured the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights. As a former inspector general, I always heard about this idea of the inspector general being captured by the agency that, that the inspector general oversees. Um, the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights really has become a lapdog for the Congress, and I'd like Congress to uh, exercise some meaningful oversight. Go ahead, Catherine, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say that those are a lot of articles that I had not seen even as I was trying to look back um, because some of those I'm not sure have been digitized um, and might not be online. Yeah, um, I couldn't, I couldn't find those. any, yeah. Yeah, um, I think something that might be helpful for folks is to differentiate, this is for all three of you, to differentiate a little bit. I know uh, on the Hill, there are the non-political employees, architect of the Capitol, Library of Congress, police, et cetera, who have already had the right to organize. And then there's, you know, largely political staff. Of course, there's also some nonpartisan staff who will gain that right on Monday. Um, and I'm hoping to talk quickly about what makes the Hill different than organization at an agency or other across the federal government. And the there's a focus on workers are workers, but also this is a very strange workplace um, that has provided me with no end of weird work <laughs> to look into. Um, so I, I think any of you can start on those differences at this point. So I'll just jump in and then hand it off to Jeff and, and to Yvette. Um, my mission when I started as uh, employment counsel for the architect of the Capitol was really to show the architect that you could live with uh, the Congressional Accountability Act um, laws having been applied. Uh, there are so many to talk about, uh, it could fill up this whole space, but uh, likewise, uh, in particular here, union representatives are not uh, in, uh, somehow um, contrary to the constitutional responsibilities that Congress uh, exercises. Uh, so I'll hand it off to Jeff and Yvette. 
Yeah, so uh, hi, I'm Jeff Friday. I'm an FE General Counsel. Um, I think I can answer the uh, uh, Catherine's question really just by going into the remarks I was going to make. It was basically, I would say that um, every workplace, you know, the employees feel that it is unique and there are unique obstacles to any union campaign. Um, but I would say that basically organizing the employees of Congress is going to be the same. I mean, as organizing employees anywhere. In the private sector, you, you, you have a process to go through with the NLRB. In the uh, uh, federal sector, you, you do a similar process through the FLRA. And, and now what's been set up is that the Office of Compliance is going to administer a similar process, which they're, they're supposed to look to the FLRA for, you know, uh, how to do it. Um, and so it's going to be, it's going to be basically the, the same, I think. And so, you know, when I'm talking to folks about, uh, you know, when they consider whether or not they want to have a union, there's usually two things that they're concerned about. First of all, like why, why, what can the union do for me? Right. Um, and so, and Taylor in his opening remarks, Talked about you know some things that have, uh, working conditions for Hill employees. I mean, you have uh, you've had January six. Everybody's had COVID. You know, in the last few years, you know, health and safety concerns have never been more paramount. Um, congressional employees are um, paid poorly as co uh, compared to their counterparts in federal agencies, and and certainly way you know uh, poorly when compared to like lobbyists that they deal with. Uh, you know, on the other the other side of the the table, um, and so um, I, I would think congressional employees would probably like to have some input into how much they got paid. Uh, they probably like to have some input into whether or not they could, were an at will employee, or would they rather have uh, some sort of due process uh, before they were going to be uh, disciplined and removed. And so th these are the kind of issues that a union addresses. You know. Uh, hours of work, leave, promotions, telework, discipline, soup to nuts. And, uh, you know, workers always have a version of concerns about that. And it, it, through a union, you're able to uh, put rights around that in a contract, which is enforceable uh, before a third party, and, uh, you know, an, arbitra an arbitrator, basically. Um, so, you know, that, that's what a union does for you. Now about the, the process, um, you know, Catherine was mentioning constitutional concerns. So I, th I think the NLRA is, uh, says that collective bargaining is in, in the American interest. The uh, Civil Service Reform Act says that collective bargaining is in the public interest for, for federal employees. And, uh, you know, I think that's what's been glommed onto by the Office of Compliance. Um, so um, beginning on January 18th, when employees have these these rights, house house employees, then um, they're, you know, the employees will be able to uh, either th through through an organization like the Congressional Workers Union or whatever union is is uh, formally organizing the the folks, uh, th they would be able to begin to collect uh, uh, forms for interest in election. So so. Uh, would be either interest cards or membership forms, uh, you know, that employees would sign saying, hey, I'd like, to have, I'd like to have a union election. I'd be interested in having that. And they sign and date it. That's a, your basic interest card. And, and um, the Office of Compliance is going to follow the federal rules, which are actually the same as the NLRB rules, that if 30% of employees in a bargaining unit, and so it seems like uh, there may well be the initial setup might be organizing, you know, office by office, shop by shop. Uh, and if 30% of the employees that are not supervisors in that office uh, fill out that interest form, then uh, they can file for an election and the Office of Compliance will conduct a secret ballot election and they can elect a union as a representative. Now, an important principle there, that, and it's the same in the NLRB, in, in the private sector and federal sector is that uh, secrecy of the uh, forms is, is a hallmark. So uh, management does not find out who signed the, the, the card or the form 
uh, asking for an election. Those forms are collected by whoever's collecting them, the, the union, uh, then uh, they are submitted to the Office of Compliance, which will have like a labor component of that, um, which is gonna administer the election. They in turn would ask for the particular office for a list of employees, and they would verify the, the 30%. So it's, it's usually important employees are interested in knowing that uh, they're not gonna be, their, their particular manager is not gonna know that they're one of the ones that are gonna be calling for that election. And then there will be a secret ballot election. Uh, oftentimes nowadays they're done electronically. I'm not sure whether here they would be done, you know, uh, you know, with a, uh, you know, setting up a voting booth, you know, on a particular day that people would come come and vote. Um, or I believe e-elections are part of what the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights has set out for this process at this yeah. point. So it's going to be a secret ballot election in, in some form. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, then employees sh should know that uh, when they're collecting the forms that, uh, from their coworkers, kind of, there's, there's going to be some discussion that goes on amongst employees in this process that uh, generally they want to do that stuff on uh, lunchtime, break time, before and after work. And, you know, in the, in the Zoom world we live in, I'm not sure how you know, much that's going to crop up, but uh, that's the technical thing. And then, you know, employees are protected. Any any retaliate people uh, people are generally concerned about retaliation, and retaliation is illegal. And um, you know, I just would not expect it. You know, uh, Congressman Levin is talking about strikes and you know, captive audience meetings and that kind of stuff. I wouldn't expect in the in the public sector world that you would see that sort of thing. The employer is supposed to be neutral. And I think I would expect by and large that they will be neutral. Uh, many of them will not like having a union. They don't, you know, some of them do. Uh, Congress, uh, Congresswoman Pelosi and Tenny Hoyer and many of the uh, folks are, are op openly supported. But generally speaking, bosses, you know, would rather not have to deal with employees being empowered. Um, but in the public sector, they they uh, rarely resort to the the kind of uh, retaliation that you see in the private sector. So I'm going to event to add on anything there. So yeah, I mean, even if there are wayward comments that are anti-union, um, those are fully enforceable, um, and and we want to make sure that you know, you all are empowered so that if you do have any sort of interference with the exercise of your rights, that um, you know that you can do something about it. And we want to stop that right in its place because it can have a real chilling effect. Um, but the most important thing I would say that Jeff just kind of gave us a great overview of the whole process, but the first step, I think will start July 18th for you all. We've got to start collecting your signatures on that on those forms to, to develop the showing of interest. That's the very first step. Um, and it's really going to be incumbent on all of you to get the, that message out to your coworkers and talk to them that even though Congressman Levine and Kevin and all of his years of work have, have really laid the groundwork for the union to come into the halls of Congress, it's really on the employees to make it happen. You can't be supportive of the union, but not do anything. You have to actually sign the form. We have to get the election going and then you have to vote. So that would be my primary focus right now would be just having those conversations with your coworkers, telling them about the benefits of the union, find out what they're worried about. Um, you know, and for NEFI, the National Federation of Federal Employees, we represent over 100,000 employees at all these different agencies. And right now, you know, they are really trying to become the model employer. And there are a lot of things that the executive branch is doing that it's baffling that <laughs> your branch is not doing. And I think that we could just use the same model that we've been using for the executive branch and, and get you all, um, you know, a, 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 a path to promotion. Um, that's predictable. So you can plan your lives. Uh, like Jeff was saying, just having that job protection is huge, uh, but employees need to step up and sign and join the union if they really want to get all of those benefits. 
that is, I think that's really helpful info as we, you know, head into the week that it's going to happen. Um, one thing that um, I would love to address is you touched on it now with the signing of the cards, kind of like what conversations would look like in an organizing office um, but now before there are protections and versus what might be, you know, newly possible st starting on Monday. Um, and in terms of you represent a huge, huge number of federal employees. And what we know is that the power of a union is the collective nature of it, how many people. Um, and I know what cons this is tied into one of the questions we have from the audience is um, going office to office in the house, the number of eligible employees in an office across the hill is many, but in an individual office might be very few. And how, I don't know if you have examples of what organizing looks like or what unionizing looks like with a very, very small eligibility um, in a workplace. So there are all different types of bargaining units and sometimes they're, they're very small. I mean, you look at a Starbucks, I mean, they're, they, they don't have very many employees at a, a particular Starbucks. Uh, but there, there's also a, a process of consolidating units uh, that you can, if you get a bunch of little ones, and ultimately you can combine them. You, it it, it might, might be possible to do a campaign across, like the, uh, try to create a bargaining unit of all the, uh, the Democratic, or, or sorry, the, uh, in the House of Representatives, all the, the, uh, the staff of all the, all the Congress people in one bargaining unit. And that's, you certainly, there are advantages to doing it that way. And that you have more power, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's simpler, you know, than, than dealing with, you know, uh, place by place by place and then combining. Um, but that's, that kind of depends on the logistics of, you know, making that happen. Uh, and, uh, but either way, ultimately you, you end up making progress you end up impacting, you go from a situation where working conditions are just what you get, uh, you know, to us to where they're determined uh, and, and put into a, a enforceable collective bargaining agreement. I will just add on, you know, organizing can be very organic, like maybe employees come in and they already know from past jobs or just from the news about their rights. And so, you know, they seek it out themselves. But in our experience, you have to have a plan in place in order to really do it well and to do it right and to make sure that everyone that um, might be interested is at least talked to. And, and, and there's a conversation, a one-on-one. -on -one. And so I would encourage you all to, and I know you do have um, some leadership, but I would encourage you to get those plans in place already. Um, see what you can do to find um, the names of the employees that are in a certain hall that you think are likely going to be in a union if one was formed and, and divide up the work and share with each other, okay, who talked to this person? Who talked to that person? What were they concerned about? Um, you know, the good thing about organizing in the federal sector is we have a lot that we can bargain. Um, and certainly on Capitol Hill, there's a lot that can be put on the table and the union should always be focused on bargaining for what the collective wants. Um, and so there's very little, I think, that's that's limiting as far as what is possible with union rights. Um, and certainly, you know, we would be more than happy to help out sort of, you know, massage the message and connect to say, you know, we're not going to write a check we can't cash, but look what federal unions and in, in the executive branch have been able to achieve. This would fit what your issue is as well. Um, so again, I would encourage, have a plan, try and get as many conversations with people that are similarly situated and, you know, just leave this power, this tool before them and then let them choose whether they want to be on board or not. But I, I think it's an easy sell um, once you start having those conversations, but it won't, you won't have any success in organizing if you don't have a plan and you don't have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. 
I know that I heard from a lot of, you know, surprised, upset staffers upon the realization that salary on the Hill, um, like negotiating specific salaries might not be within the scope of what is bargainable um, or on the table for bargaining. Um, And I'm with you describing like how much is possible. I think salary becomes a focus on the Hill because there's not data about office to office, what other benefits are offered because it's every office is like its own small business. I I prefer fiefdom. (laughs) Um, And so what you can look up is people's salaries and what you can't look up is their maternity leave policy, their um, bereavement leave policy or, you know, vacation time or anything like that. Or is it an unwritten rule that you can only take time off at certain times and stuff like that? Um, All of that is you find out from talking to your peers office to office, but it's, you can't search it. Like you can search salaries. So I, can you talk about the other things besides salary that are on the table and that would be going through a process with office of congressional workplace rights to determine that is eligible to be bargained versus not? Well, so, uh, you know, first of all, whatever concerns and, uh, workplace concerns and issues that people have, the union can address. You know, and it may be that some of them are addressed through collective bargaining and, and depending on how things roll out in terms of like negotiability, we have issues of negotiability sometimes in the federal sector. Um, maybe some things are, are addressed not in, in the collective bargaining agreement, but they are addressed, you know, you, you, because the workers have all banded together and they bring their concerns to management and they push for change. And so, you know, one way or another, progress occurs, and not always super quickly, you know, sometimes it takes a while, but, uh, you know, uh, again, in the private sector, you have more, more wide open, uh, you know, n- not issues with negotiability. In the f- in federal sector, there's all kinds of volumes of stuff that talked about negotiability, but concerns, uh, important concerns are always addressed one way or another, you know. And one thing we, I would encourage all of you to quickly get in place would be since you, as soon as you have the election, you have an exclusive representative and with that comes power. And I would quickly try and establish what we have in the executive branch is labor management forums, where we try and get um, information from the agencies before decisions are made so that we can have input um, and a seat at the table and the decisions that impact us before the decision is made. And then we still have the opportunity to bargain the impact and the implementation after the decision is made. Um, so that's one example um, of, of collective bargaining and how we can you know, try and build in uh, sort of custom structures like labor management forums to, to give us that formalized opportunity to provide input or even to raise issues. Um, and yes, there are some legal limit. There's quite a few legal limitations on what is negotiable. Um, I'm not super clear on the pay component, um, but in the federal sector, the executive branch, we cannot negotiate pay because that's set by Congress. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, anything that you know is, is under appropriations, we cannot negotiate. But we do negotiate um, career ladder promotions. Um, so someone has a predictable path to promotions. We negotiate um, awards for performance. We can even negotiate where we establish separate awards funds, where it might be a joint union management panel, where we actually have the opportunity to nominate people for awards. Um, and then we can negotiate all around, you know, other things that that might end up being pocketbook type issues like remote work. Um, you know, how much gas are you going to save if you're going to be able to remote work a lot more uh, or telework? Um, you know, even things like parking benefits. Um, <laughs> that's that's the type of thing that is absolutely on the table. Um, and one thing that that Catherine, you mentioned was, you know, maternity leave policy and each little fiefdom having their own rule. If you have a union, you negotiate one rule for everybody and it's written down. 
and it's enforceable. And if anybody chooses to roll out their own rule, then we enforce the contract rule. And that, and for example, you know, a leave policy. Um, if if a supervisor or your boss wants to have their own rule on a leave policy, they can't. They are required and bound to follow what's in the union contract. So when things are written down. Um, and they're agreed to by the parties, it just clears up so much ambiguity, protects people from unfair treatment, favoritism, um, and just, you know, makes things clear and you, you have good expectations. And I, I can't tell you, we've been doing this a long time, Jeff and I, I've, I've been doing it about 15 years and I don't even know, Jeff probably won't allow yeah. me to say how long he's been at it, but it makes such a difference to have a union contract in place. And we're gonna need all the help all of you are gonna to have to come up with what you wanna put in that contract. Um, it's a member driven document and it takes a lot of work to bargain it. Um, but you know, first things first, let's get the union in. Um, and then after that, then you can focus on the contract. Catherine, um, can, can I jump in? Uh, absolutely. Just with the question uh, for Jeff and Yvette. Uh, the employees on Capitol Hill have always been told that they're at will employees. Talk about the impact of having a contract and a grievance arbitration provision. Yeah, so people sleep better at night knowing that, um, that there's there's a process, there would have to be a process put in place before they would lose their, their job. You know, and generally, uh, you know, uh, and sometimes, you know, people accuse unions of, uh, you know, helping bad employees, you know. Uh, we don't really have the right that if so, if somebody's a truly bad employee and, and deserves to be let go, then they will be let go. Um, but uh, what we do can ensure is due process that people you know are given a reason, are, are given an opportunity to respond to that, and then they you know, they get a chance to go before an arbitrator who's like Judge Judy and decides whether or not they should have been fired or not. And uh, many times. Management wasn't fire, uh, wasn't uh, fair. They actually let other people do the exact same thing, and didn't, and they didn't fire them for that. And 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 that those are the reasons why arbitrators uh, overturn decisions like that. And then many people don't get let go because of the whole process. That rather just you know having a knee jerk reaction to something that happened and, and firing somebody, it has to be a more considered process, which uh, you know. And then that, resu that results in people, you know, uh, feeling a lot less stress on a daily basis. And, you know, having that knowledge that they, they uh, have some security in their employment. So. On that at will employee point, I think there's a great question in the submitted from the audience about tech or correct me if I'm wrong, I've understood that you know, a staffer in a member's office or on a committee um, are almost equivalent to a political appointee. Um, and so how, what would job protection look like if, you know, a member resigns early to take a job in the private sector or because of scandal or all of the reasons that well, members are Capitol somebody's not, Hill and somebody's. there's not... Are yeah. those folks are not guaranteed a job with the replacement member who fills that seat? Is that correct? Well, there could be, the question raises some things that you know some nuances that I, uh, you know uh, could be tricky, I guess. But basically, um, if if they're eligible to be in the bargaining unit and they and they have a union, and it, and one of the first things that you one in the contract is a just cause provision, which says that people cannot be let go. So instead of being at will, you just cause is required and it'll be some sort of a process. And, and that would have to be gone through for anybody that was under that agreement. Um, and so like if someone resigns in scandal, let's say a Democrat resigns in scandal, um, it's happened before in both parties, of course, and there's a special election and a Republican gets elected. So if anyone wants to, wants to keep that job, I don't, I, there's not a lot of staff that switch between parties, but if someone wanted to keep that job just for the paycheck, just for a little stability until they find something new, 
what is that even possible? Because it's it's you well, basically maybe, knew. Maybe it could be just okay. cause if you uh, you know someone from a different party came in and said, look, I want I want to have uh, my my people in there and not people from the other party, and that right. might be, that might be a, a type of just cause where they were allowed to do that. You know? Okay, but on the other hand, you know, if your supervisor just got crosswise of you on a particular day, you know, right. that might, might not be uh, just cause. So. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a question that a lot, especially, you know, with the midterms coming up that a lot of folks up here have, um, stability seems like a contradiction sometimes for having a job on the Hill, because um, especially in the house, your, bo your boss could be gone every two years, um, if not sooner. Um, and so I know that that is a question that is percolating. Absolutely. Well, um, if, you go all, if you go all the way back, you know, before the Pendleton Act, all federal employees were like that. They were, they were just could be willy nilly, you know, uh, come and go. And, but civil service protections were put in. So this is a version of civil service protections that are being put in. How it's all going to spin out exactly, I think, is a little bit speculative. So. Yeah, the question really highlights one of those differences and unknowns between, you know, the Capitol Hill workers and executive branch workers. Yeah. Um, but I would just add on what would it look like? What what would the system look like that employees want in that scenario? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do they want a seniority ranking? Like, how would layoffs go? I mean, we negotiate procedures all the time that deal with that. Um, so once we would, you know, I think get to the bargaining table, we'd want to really know all the creative ideas that employees might have for what, um, you know, that parachute of sorts would look like. And it, we can't promise anything because it's, it's just a weird thing unique to you all right now. Yeah. But we can build it. Catherine, I think, can I jump in? And uh, I know there was a question about conflicts. Yeah, that's what um, I was going to jump in first to and, say that the clerk's office often, so just for people who are watching, staff who are watching, if your boss leaves for whether they, God forbid, pass away or resign in victory or, or not, um, the clerk often takes over. So that is like something that would need to be outlined in my understanding in a contract of what your relationship with is then with the clerk's office for that intervening period. And I think that is something that any organizing office will be trying to address in their contract. Sorry, Kevin, yeah. to interrupt. Uh, so one of the questions was about, uh, is there uh, somehow a conflict uh, where a member staff might or committee staff might be overseeing um, a specific union um, that could be associated with the union organizing. And the way I can just talk about my own experience, I was a union steward and a bargaining unit member at the National Labor Relations Board. And because the NLRB oversees all private sector unions in the country, um, our professional association uh, from its inception decided uh, not to affiliate. So we were just a local professional association union in the uh, general counsel staff in Washington. And um, in that way, we avoided conflicts uh, with those unions that we oversaw. And, uh, and that it seems to me is the answer for some of the offices on Capitol Hill, particularly Ed and Labor and uh, other um, uh, workforces that uh, are really, you know, e even Representative Levin's staff, um, where he has such a big voice with regard to unions. Uh, you could have a shop union that, uh, you know, I don't want to say anything bad about the National Federation of Federal Employees, but, but it's possible to have a, a, a union that's just simply a local shop union. Yeah, you can, you can have, in, there are independent unions and then there are unions that affiliated uh, with, with big organ, union organizations and there's pros and cons to, to it in terms of independence and uh, versus support you get with, if you, you know, do, you know, 
sign on with a you know a larger group. But that's kind of up to the employees as part of the organizing process. Is you know, um, but the one thing I would say is that for employees, uh, at some point you're going to have to stand up. You know, at least some of you are going to have to stand up and be leaders and and be out there because it. It, it's not, it doesn't occur anonymously. You know, it, it, you know management doesn't see who signs of forms, but those folks, so it's a movement and the movement's gotta have leaders and the leaders have gotta, these are legal rights that you have. And some of you have to be willing to step up and say, I am taking them and, and come with me, my uh, coworkers and let's do this, you know. Um, I just want to address that in the chat and in the Q&A, there are a handful of like really specific questions about how individuals can get involved. And I, I just want to kind of address the elephant in the room is that there aren't staff on this call right now asking you to an, join their union because they're not protected until Monday. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to, that some, someone is looking for how, what, can someone send me the card to sign to say you're interested in a union? Um, that is, that is start talking to people in your office, start asking around on the Hill about who in your office or other offices is discussing moving forward with unionization. Um, I cannot speak for the congressional workers union, but I know that they are conferring with many staff and kind of, providing a um, a path forward, training and what the next steps are. Um, so that's just, I just wanna say there's general advice being given, but I, I cannot provide, you know, your union card. I, I have my own union card um, as a political employee, but um, I just wanna say, I apologize if we don't get to those specific questions because that is work that is happening behind the scenes right now. Um, and, and I think hopefully only for five more days. Exactly. And, and hopefully we'll finally see some faces with the movement and have some established leaders that. Yes. Like I just didn't want anyone to, Stepping yeah. into their power and leading. Yes. Oh. I just didn't want anyone to feel like I was ignoring your question. I just, we just might not be able to address um, how you personally will be able to get involved. Um, <laughs> But I promise you, I'm talking to staff all the time and it is percolating, man. So um, <laughs> if you ask around, if you feel comfortable doing that or you can start on Monday, um, it's out there. <laughs> and I wondered, uh, Jeff and Yvette, whether you could uh, uh, put your uh, contact information in the chat or, or uh, in some way give your, uh, your web yeah. address. Yeah. The way we're set up here down here, we can't get access to chat because we're, uh, but um, if I could just, my email is jfriday at nepi.org if, if you can type that in there in the bed. Ypiacek at nffe.org. And, and we're happy to answer, you know, you know people, there's specific uh, questions can be directed to, to us, um, you know. Taylor, I might ask you to do that because you have all their contact info. Yep, I'll drop it in the chat. Thanks all. Great. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to add on there, you know, Nephi, we are not leading this charge. We are simply here today to offer advice. You know, we are part of the movement and we think it's great what you all are doing and we absolutely want to help as much as we can. Um, but, you know, this would not be a, a, a Nephi unit by any means. We haven't even had those conversations at all. So, um, but we just wanted to share what we know from our experience and offer it up going forward. You know, uh, we're here to help. So, yeah, one of the questions is do, do offices have to work with the Congressional Workers Union? Um, and I, in my understanding, is that you no, know, you could go outside to one of these established large unions that have unionized other federal workplaces. Um, I Please correct me if I'm wrong. It's my understanding that the Congressional Workers Union is like uh, similar to the Amazon situation where Amazon workers started their own organization to organize uh, their workplace, um, as opposed to saying, I want to be part of um, a larger established um, 
union with you know many many different locals um and it's there you get gain similar protections and everything it's just two different flavors of how to move forward um so i, I know that a lot of unions there's confusion sometimes about whether i work on the hill i'm i don't i'm a reporter uh but a, a bunch of big federal unions reached out to me at the beginning of this process to say like we would love to represent people on the hill so if for whatever reason work workers on the hill want to go outside that is an option you're not locked into the congressional workers union but that's who i know most people are working with at this point yeah people can sign cards for the congressional uh, workers union or they can sign cards for another organization whatever the name on the card goes on the, the ballot for the union election and that becomes the union uh, okay, that's helpful. If they, if they were, I would say that if they end up being represented by a bunch of different unions, that's another complicated factor. That yeah, pick one. <laughs> is, is, you you have more power if you're in one bargaining unit with one organization. You know. So. Um, Taylor had mentioned there was some you know really concerning data came out um, of the Senate this week about pay disparity racially across Senate staff. And I know we're talking about House staff right now, but Taylor had mentioned that you bet you might want to address diversity and inclusion in the unionizing process. I'm hoping that you can touch on that because I know that um, especially a lot of the staff associations and other things uh, have had questions about what this process looks like and how it can affect equity um, in a workplace. Thank you. Yeah, but I can speak to our executive branch experience. Um, you know, this has been an issue that we've in the labor movement been trying to nibble around for years, but it's been tricky because the EEO laws are honestly, I, I don't think they're good enough. Um, I think that they re-victimize a lot of people that want to go through that process. And now under the Biden administration, um, labor finally has a seat at the table to try and work new processes into our, our union functionality to tackle those big issues like pay equity, um, you know, just basic discrimination in the workplace. You know, under the last administration, all federal employees in the executive branch were pulled out of diversity training. Um, and now, you know, we're back not only having diversity training again, but actually bargaining, um, you know, expanded procedures so that we can bring, we can enforce EEO laws through our own union process. Uh, by filing a grievance, we can we can allege discrimination there as well as contractual violations, um, and avoid the hassle of the protracted EEO process and depositions, and you know them getting a hold of your medical records through the grievance process. We can allege all of the same things and keep it a lot simpler and more cost effective, and you know oftentimes resolve it at a very low level as well. Um, like maybe just transferring that employee out of the office where it's toxic um, or, or addressing it through larger through the labor management forum discussions like we need to talk about this issue because the union has surveyed and we see it's systemic um, or we have access to information through the union that's even better than FOIA I mean reporters individuals anybody can request information from the government but the union can request information often that might be excluded and or redacted, but we can get it if it relates to our representation of our members. Um, and so that really is helpful in the discrimination front. We can request data of salaries and see who was promoted, how long um, they were not promoted for and detect those patterns and then file a grievance on behalf of the entire unit and try and fix those patterns. Um, there's a lot that also we're doing just through um, the Office of Personnel Management on hiring reform, because often diversity is not achieved at the moment of hiring. Um, and so we are really working hard to make sure that at least executive branch is an employer of choice and that they are getting out there and recruiting from disadvantaged communities to ensure that at least the federal workforce looks like America, because right now it doesn't. Um, executive branch and where you all are, it just doesn't. 
Um, but with ideas from the people that are on the Hill, um, identifying that, you know, hey, I had to work this job for free, you know, my internship, I didn't get paid. Um, you know, putting those stories out there is the best way to then figure out what the solution might be, which then designs a proposal that goes in the contract that we can enforce. A few folks are saying they have to head to the vote series that is underway right now. If you guys have closing thoughts on these issues as uh, staff head into the next few days and into next week, especially. If I could uh, just mention again, I, I think uh, if anybody is on who has impact into oversight over the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights, the office has such a potential and really can uh, do a lot in this area and you know, certainly is a place to call. But as I've seen it, um, the labor um, section, the uh, a number of the sections have just been neglected. And uh, there, the, the office was designed with staggered terms for the board members, for example, and because um, the board members were particularly favorable towards the, um, um, towards the uh, Congress. They were kept on and kept on and kept on. So there really needs to be uh, uh, meaningful oversight over this office, handing it over to Yvette and Jeff. So uh, we all spend uh, half of our waking hours or, or more at work. And, you know, uh, the Office of Compliance came about 30 years ago, but starting next week, uh, there, there's going to be the potential for major change for uh, employees in the House. And uh, it's an exciting time and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, rather than just grousing about stuff, you can actually make progress and demand progress, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just want to say, if your office is unionizing, I want to hear about it. I want to pick your brain, hear how it's going, hear everything about it. So my email's in here somewhere. So get in touch. <laughs> yeah, hopefully this is just the start of many conversations. Um, I, I just wanted to share that you have a ton of support within the movement. You know, Jeff and I are easy points of contact now, but everybody that I talk to within the movement, you've got a lot of people rooting for you. So just step into that power, sign your forms and let's get this show on the road. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to our panelists, the moderator and attendees for joining today's virtual event. Um, I found it extremely informative and helpful and I hope everybody did as well. If you're interested in following this issue more closely, as well as everything relating to creating a stronger, more transparent and inclusive Congress, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter. It's uh, the first branch forecast. It's free and it comes out every Monday. Um, and then, of course, subscribe to Politico Huddle, who uh, the writer is our moderator, Catherine Tully McManus. So thank you all once again. This recording will be available after the fact for those who either left or couldn't attend, so that will be distributed as well. So thanks.